thinking out loud. This is a series about watching our words and putting a filter on our mouth and recognizing the relationship that exists between the heart and the mouth and not taking pride in speaking our mind. Now, you wouldn't do it, but somebody you know will, 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 will in pride say, oh, I speak my mind as if that's a good thing, and that's not always a good thing. It might explain why they're unemployed right now and why lost three jobs. It, it might explain all the relationships they've been in and out of. So, you know, it just doesn't work when we just speak our mind. So I want to start here in Psalms 141, and we got a lot of scripture we're going to look at today, but we'll start here in Psalms 141. Notice what the word says here in verse 3. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. Now, this is a prayer that David prays, but I think it's one that we can all relate to because if you live just for a minute, you know we all have the potential of getting, trouble, getting in trouble with our mouth. I want to turn back to Psalms, the 19th division, if you would. Psalms 19, this is the verse I had planned to open with, but uh, I want to show you this. Psalms 19, we'll look at it down in verse number 14 because in Psalms 19, verse 14, we're going to see the relationship between the mind and the mouth, the relationship between the mind and the mouth. And again, we got to get out of this habit of just speaking our mind, and we've certainly got to break this habit as if that's a good thing. It's not a good thing. And I'm going to show you in the Word today why it's not a good thing. It's not a good thing because speaking your mind without any restraint is damaging to relationships. And every one of us, because God made us to be relational people, every one of us have a certain quality in our life. And it is likely today that the quality of your life is based on the quality of your relationships. Which means right now, if there's some breakup in your life, in your marriage or, uh, or, or any aspect of life, when, when, when our relationships aren't healthy, our lives are not healthy. God's made us to be relational people, and that relationship begins with him, and it, flow out, it flows out into the way we treat others. And if there's anything that affects our relationship with people, it's what we say. And so if we're going to be, you know, successful in relationship, we've got to be successful in the way we communicate. And so thinking out loud and just saying whatever comes to mind is bad advice. And if that's been you and if that's been me, that's something that needs to change. And I'm going to show it to you in the Word uh, why that needs to change. Now watch this in Psalms 19. We'll look at it in verse 14. If you're there, just say Amen. Let the words of my mouth, there's the mouth, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, so there's the thought, the meditation of my heart, there's the heart and there, there, there's the mind and then we see the mouth. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation, the thoughts of my heart or my mind be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. What a prayer. So David here is not only praying by God's spirit that his words be right, but he is praying that the meditation of his heart be right. And the reason being is because the one is going to always affect the other. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 12, around verse 35, that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So the mouth will speak what the heart is full of. And so there's this relationship between the mouth and the mind or the heart that many people try to make themselves exempt of because I've heard things like, well, I might have said that, but God knows my heart. But yeah, you said that because it was in your heart. And I'm not saying we can't slip and say some stuff we wish we could retract, but you gotta know that what you say consistently and what comes out of your mouth actually counts and we can't ignore what you say when you say, well, God knows my heart. I know God knows your heart. And that's why he has given us this advice over and over again in scripture to put a guard over our mouth and to pray in faith that the Lord would align our thoughts, our meditations, and our our words because uh, the one affects the other. Hallelujah. Now, I want to just add to this and just, 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 just build to this case. So if you would, turn over to the book of Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, and I want to go to the uh, 10th chapter, Proverbs chapter 10. Proverbs comes right behind Psalms, Proverbs chapter 10. So just think about, you know, judge yourself real quick. I've had to judge myself preparing this series some time ago and I've had to judge myself after 21 years of marriage 
because, um, you know, I, 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 I had to learn if I want marriage to be healthy, I can't say everything I think. So the dogs got fat because I had to go feed them a lot. Because that would prevent me from saying something that was going to make things worse. So I'm going to go out and feed the dogs. And I went out there and talked to Jesus. And then Jesus showed me I didn't need to say what I was getting ready to say before I went and fed the dogs. The dogs got fat, but my, my marriage got better. <laughs> See, you, you ha we have to have a check on our mouth. And, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want this to be practical. I want this to be something that you can easily remember and that the Holy Spirit can keep us mindful of. Because I'm telling you, once our relationships get healthier, our lives gets, get, get healthier, and, and, and life tends to move at the speed of relationship. And you might be in the standstill right now because relationally things just aren't going well, and this is going to be a series that will change everything. You know, th this could save somebody's marriage, and I'm not exaggerating. This is real. This could literally save somebody's marriage right now. Now, don't raise your hand and say, yes, it's me, oh, Lord. No, we don't need to know because y'all look good in church today, all right? You look good. You matching, y'all coordinating, you got straight up Sadie Hawkins up in here, man. This is awesome. So, so we don't need to know what's going on in your house, all right? But this word on <laughs> that Sadie Hawkins, yeah, whoo, all right. Proverbs chapter 10, when you get there, say amen. Proverbs chapter 10, we'll look at it down in verse number 19, Proverbs 10, verse number 19. In the multitude of words, in the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin. What does that mean in this old King James language? It means if you're going to say a lot, you're not going to have to look very hard for sin. That in the multitude of words, there's no want of sin. There's plenty of it. Which means if we are people that just feel everything that's on our mind, sin is going to happen. There's going to be some sin that's going to come out of that. And I'm going to show you here in a minute how, how, how we actually sin with our words. So he says, in the multitude of words, there's no want for sin. In other words, if you say enough stuff, there's going to be something in there to mess something up. So, so we, we, we can't just spew out everything that we think. In the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin. Now, the next part of this verse is, is, is heavy and important. Not that the first part isn't. But we, we, we see something that uh, we can glean from and build on in the second part, verse 19. But he that refraineth his lips is wise. Read that part out loud. But he that refraineth his lips is wise. Now notice the, the use of the word wise. If I'm just going to spew out whatever comes to mind, then there won't be any want of sin. That I'm going to give the, any, the enemy plenty and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to bring all kind of problems on my life if I just spew out everything that comes to mind. There's no, it wants not, there's no wanting of sin in that. It's not healthy to speak all your mind. But the second part of the verse says, the one that refrains his lips, there's discipline over his mouth. He might think it, but he's not saying it. He has a discipline over his mouth. He said, now this guy is wise. And I want to spend some time talking about wisdom. And the reason being is because we, 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 we tend to lean on knowledge. We tend to build up knowledge. And knowledge is important. Hosea 4, 6 says people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Isaiah 5, 13, God says my people have gone into bondage because of a lack of knowledge. Knowledge is powerful. But wisdom is knowing how to use knowledge. Wisdom is to know how to use knowledge. Imagine if you had a, a shed at your house, a workshop, loaded down with every tool known to man, but you couldn't operate but three of them. Well, then it doesn't matter that you've got a shop filled with tools if you can't use them. It would be better for you to have a few things that you're effective with than a bunch of things you can't even use. So wisdom is the use of knowledge. And when you talk about how to use knowledge, I, I wrote down four things at minimum that that speak of wisdom when it comes to knowledge. And, 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 and here's, here they are. It's knowing what to say, when to say it, where to say it, and how to say it. One more time. Wisdom is to know what to say, when to say, where to say, and how to say. That's wisdom. Wisdom is the management. It's the stewardship of knowledge. Now, Jesus is the Christ. What does that mean? He's the anointed one. That's what Christ means, Jesus, the anointed one. 
What was and is Jesus anointed with? He's anointed with the Spirit of God. That's what he declared in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, when he stood up and said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he hath anointed me. And when Jesus said that, he was referring to one of the seven different anointings that the Holy Spirit gives. And you can find these seven anointings in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, and I'm going to give them to you. It's the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of the fear of the Lord, wisdom, knowledge, counsel, understanding, and might. Seven anointings that the Holy Spirit offers the believer. Seven anointings. The Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of the fear of the Lord, wisdom, knowledge, understanding, counsel, and might. So the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of the fear of the Lord, might. What is might? It's strength. When you say, I can do all things through Christ, that strengthens me. What have you really said when you quote Philippians 4.13? You've really said, I can do all things through the anointing of Christ who strengthens me. Well, what anointing gives strength? Might. The reason I bring this up is because the anointings of the Spirit, all seven of them, will remove burdens and destroy yokes according to Isaiah 10.27. Any one of them. But of the seven, Proverbs 4, 7 says the essential one is wisdom. Proverbs 4, 7 says, get wisdom, get wisdom, get wisdom. It is the principal thing. In other words, if you don't have wisdom, it won't really matter that you have knowledge because you don't know how to use knowledge. And for many of us, when we gain knowledge or information, whether it's insight into another or something that we've heard or picked up on, we, we, we think it's time now just to share every Everything you believe you know, but that's not wisdom. Wisdom knows what to say, when to say it, where to say it, and how to say it. Wisdom is the stewardship of knowledge. So imagine if you just got a lot of money in your life. Maybe some rich uncle left you in his will and you just got loaded. If you don't have any wisdom in your stewardship of finances, it's only going to be a matter of time that you're broke again. All that money would not have resolved anything for you. You might have bought up a lot of stuff, but that stuff's going to get outdated. That stuff's going to fade away, and you're back broke again with no more rich uncles. And, and, and the problem would have been you didn't have any wisdom to manage what, was, what, what you were given. Knowledge has to be managed just like money. If you can't manage what you know and steward what you know, then it won't benefit you. And that's what wisdom is. It is, it is, it is to apply what I know. And so you, you and I just can't run with knowledge into our relationships and, and, and the things that God gives us. No, we ask him for wisdom so we know what to say, when to say it, where to say it, and how to say it. That's wisdom. And it's principle. It's essential according to Proverbs chapter 4, verse number 7. Now, let's turn over to Proverbs 15. C come over a few chapters to Proverbs 15. Wisdom, knowing what to say, when to say it, where to say it, and how to say it. A person that doesn't know what to say, when to say it, and where to say it, we call immature. That's why you got to watch what you tell your children. Because when Uncle Hank comes over and he's done heard, your child has heard what you said. Your child doesn't know this ain't what to say, this ain't where to say it, and this ain't when to say it. Daddy said, you're ignorant. Is it true, Uncle Hank? Is it true that you're really that dumb, Uncle Hank? He's like, oh, boy, boy, I'll say, go in your room and play nice. Oh, he didn't mean now. What these kids? Where they get this stuff? <laughs> See, we call, it, we call it immaturity when you're young and you don't know what to say or when to say it. When I was a little boy, we, 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 had, we had this uh, bookshelf in our, in, our, in our little hallway between my, my sister and my room, a little bit small bookshelf, where we kept the encyclopedias. Does anybody remember the days of the encyclopedias? I'm dating myself. I was one. Remember you had the project on Paris, but your, your encyclopedia collection, you was missing the P. And man, the P was down the street at your neighbor's house, and they spilled coffee on it. You had to go down there and say, hey, can I get my P back? That's before Google and the internet, man. 
Man, I'm in there just reading stuff. And, and my mama had her, uh, uh, her grandmother's Bible in there. And I'm a little boy, and I'm sitting in the hallway just reading, just randomly reading. This is a true story. I wouldn't lie to you. I had a relative over at the house. My parents did, and they were intoxicated. Anybody know what that means? <laughs> Trying to, you know, use the right word on television. Intoxicated. Somebody said, help me. They were drunk. <laughs> and my daddy would say they were drunker than Cooter Brown. I never met Cooter Brown, but that man must have drank a lot. Because everybody talks about somebody being drunk is compared to Cooter Brown. <laughs> so I'm in, I'm in there just randomly re reading past. I'm just randomly reading. And I stumbled across Isaiah 5. I, 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 I was looking for it. It just happened. And I found in Isaiah 5 that hell has gotten bigger because of the drunkards that are going into it. And I read that. I was like, oh. So I thought I better take that in the kitchen and let this intoxicated person know that. So I did. <laughs> I'm a little boy. And I went in and I called out the person. I said, listen to what Isaiah 5 says. Hell hath enlarged herself to receive the drunkards. <laughs> Man, this, this, this family member that was intoxicated got up and cussed me out. My daddy had to jump up, escort them out the house. I'm like, what'd I do? What'd I do? I had knowledge that this was not the time and this was not the place to share. Or maybe it was. <laughs> but I was young. I don't know that I would do that today. Watch Proverbs chapter 15. Proverbs chapter 15. We're going to start in verse 2 because I want to address this wisdom thing. So let's go to verse 2. The tongue of the wise. The tongue of the who? The wise, the tongue of the wise useth knowledge right. So if you can use knowledge right, you can use knowledge wrong. Well, who uses knowledge right? The wise. That's what I'm trying to tell you. There's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Wisdom, yes, has to have knowledge because I can't apply what I don't know. But I have to know how to apply what I know. And that's wisdom. And wisdom is the principal thing. And so he says here that the tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright. They know how to rightly use knowledge. They don't just use it because they know it. They use it right. But the mouth of fools, the Bible says a fool rejects knowledge, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. And so what is wisdom then? Wisdom is knowing what to say, when to say it, where to say it, and how long to say it. Knowledge itself, the Bible says, puffeth up, which means knowledge can make a man arrogant. Knowledge can make you feel like you're more than you actually are. And God does not give us knowledge to build ourselves up or to puff up our heads. That's not why we were given knowledge. So, so God doesn't give us knowledge so we can become show-offs and share with people what we know and then belittle them by saying, you didn't know that, did you? Ha ha, I know that stuff. Nobody can receive from a person that's arrogant when they use knowledge in a way to elevate themselves but belittle someone else. That's not why God gives us knowledge. And that's why wisdom is so important because wisdom knows how to use knowledge and there's some things that you're gonna learn and there's some things that you're gonna discover you know, in life that just because you know it don't mean you need to share it. Sometimes you need to set on a word, set on a thought, pray about a thought, process a thought before you act on a thought. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you a new light on a thought so that you can see it the way he sees it so that you know what to do with it. Hallelujah. So that's the difference between a fool and a wise man is that the wise man knows how to use knowledge. Now, let's look at the previous verse. Verse 1. A soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Now, let's highlight in this verse the word answer. And I got a reason for doing this because we're going to look at another verse that uses the same word. So let's highlight in this verse the word answer. A soft answer. A soft answer. So I've got the answer. I've got the response. I've got the word. I've got the knowledge. A soft answer turns away wrath. So not only... Am I supposed to have the answer 
or do I need the answer? I need to know how to use my answer. So it'd be like a person sitting in class, a student, and they've been given a paper test. And the test is laid on the, on the desk, and they've been given a pen or pencil, and they're to take the test. And they get to the question, they know the answer, so they stand up and loudly proclaim the answer. And the teacher says, okay, James A., I need you to sit down. That's not the way this test is given. This is not a verbal test. I need you to write your answer. And then James A. says, but is the answer right? James A., I'm not dealing with that with you right now because we've given you a paper test and I need you to write that in. No, no, no. Is the, but is the answer I just gave you right? I'm not going to talk about that, James A., but what I am going to do is write a referral and you're going down to the principal's office. So then James A. gets to the principal's office and tells the principal, but is my answer right? I was given a test and I gave the answer and now I get expelled. And I'm still arguing I had the right answer, but I used it the wrong way. See, the, 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 the point that I'm, 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 I'm trying to get over here is that we have to learn how to use the knowledge that we have, apply the knowledge that we have. And so here in verse 1, th- th- you can have the answer, you can know the truth, you can have the information. But watch this, how do you use it? A soft answer turns like a steering wheel. It turns away wrath. So when you have the right answer, The use of the right answer, like a steering wheel, can turn you away from anger and debate and arguing. I can actually get us out of this path of destruction. I can turn and get us off this heated argument. I can turn and resolve this anger if I take the answer and use it right softly. I think people me being guilty a time or two in my life, are bad about thinking once I have the answer, then I can just share it anyway, anytime I choose because the answer makes me right. Why are y'all so quiet? Well, drop down to verse 28. Drop down to verse 28 and watch this same word. The heart of the righteous studieth to answer. Let's read that out loud. The heart of the righteous studieth to answer. So if my heart, notice notice who's studying before they answer. The heart, the heart of the righteous. Let me read it another way. The thought of the heart of the righteous studieth to answer. See, the heart connects me to the thought and the answer connects me to the mouth. But the heart of the righteous studies He ponders it. He thinks on it. He weighs it. He prays over it. He's studying it before he says something. The heart of the righteous studies before he answers. What would happen in all of our relationships before we spoke, we studied. We processed it. So think back to your days in school or college when you studied. It's likely most of your studies were done by yourself, in your bedroom, silently in your own space. You studied, you read, you analyzed. You might have had a study group, and some of you right now might have a prayer group, or you got brothers or sisters in the Lord that you can be real with, that you can say, hey, I need to talk to you. And you pull that person to the side, and you say, hey, this is what was said to me. This is what I want to do, but what do you think? And you get counsel. What are you doing? You're studying it before you do anything with it. A righteous man in his heart, he studies before he answers. He doesn't just say what comes to mind. He doesn't think out loud. That's dangerous. He studies to answer. The heart of the righteous studies to answer. Married couples, you've got to be willing to let something go for the sake of letting it go right now. And so where this thing, you don't have the answer, you're not heading toward peace, you agree, hey, we're going to both pray about this we, we're not getting anywhere like this. I love you with all my heart. I know we're going to get through this. Can we just embrace for a minute? I want to give you a hug and remind you that I love you enough to do whatever I got to do to make this right. And if what I think is right is wrong in my heart, I need God to show it to me. Right now, I may not be able to receive this from you, but it ain't because I don't love you. Can we just give each other a hug and give this to Jesus right now? I'm not saying I'm going to ignore it or kick it under a rug. I'm just saying right now, we're not there. And you give each other a hug and you agree, you're both going to go study this thing out before you come back and talk about it again. If we learn how to process our thoughts and not just say always what comes to mind, we 
can save the most important relationships in our lives. And for married folk, it could save your marriage if you didn't just say whatever came to your mind. I, I, you know, Christian, I've been married 21 years. If you pull, if you pull me aside and say, Pastor, what's the number one thing? What's the number one thing that has affected your marriage in a positive way? I would say, my uh, uh, being able to hold my tongue, thinking of something before I say it, processing it before it is spoken. Because I'm a preacher. I've been preaching since I was 17 years old, and so it's easy for me to speak. <laughs> but that wasn't always good in a young married couple's life. It wasn't good for me to spit out a scripture that I thought would resolve the issue at hand. My wife didn't want me to be no preacher right then, be my husband. It didn't mean that, that the word of God didn't have place in our marriage. It was, the, it was the way that I used it. Wisdom is not just knowledge. It's knowing what to say, when to say it, where to say it, and how to say it. 58% of the weight of communication doesn't have anything to do with the content of our words. Actually, that's only 7% of the weight. The majority of the weight, 93% in all, is what we were doing when we were saying it and how we said it. Which means what you're doing and how you say something makes up 93% of the effectiveness of communication. Only 7% of effectiveness in communication has to do with just the content. We're all quiet now. All right, so watch verse 28. The heart of the righteous studieth to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. There's no restraint. Now, notice this word in verse 28, and then we're going to go back to verse 1. The heart of the righteous studieth to answer. So I, I, I'm studying because I want the right answer. I'm studying because I want the right response. Right? Now go back to verse 1. A soft answer. The righteous studieth to answer. Verse 1, a soft answer. See the wisdom in that? The righteous heart looks for the right answer, but the right answer is not enough alone. Not only do I want the right answer, I want to say it the right way. That's wisdom. That's wisdom. That's what saves relationships, is knowing what to say, when to say it, how to say it, and where to say it. See, you go off at the big gathering in front of 18 people and say a bunch of stuff, and then somebody pulls you aside and says, you know, a good brother, a good cousin, hey, man, man, stop, man, you better cut that out, man. This ain't the place. And then you get bold, man, oh, no, I speak my mind. You think I'm scared of these people? I tell all these people what I think. That's your problem. You can't tell all these people what you think. Some folk already thought you was crazy. You just proved them right. You just can't share all your stuff. See, even the enemy doesn't know what you think. Only God knows your heart. And so there's some things in our life that only God need to know about because I hadn't worked this thing out yet. But if I say it, I've let my enemies and the enemy know what I've been thinking. I can't just let all this out. You arm your enemy when you talk too much. Because the enemy, particularly the spirit of Jezebel, feeds on information. That's another sermon on another day. But there are people that are going to come into your life that want as much information as they can because they are out to destroy you and knowledge is power and you got to know what to share, when to share it, and how to share it. You can't tell just anybody all your business. It's dangerous. Now, I want to, I want, I want to, I want to go a, a, little, a little further in this thing here because, you know, we, we see here that not only... Saying the right thing, but saying it the right way is important. L let's go over to uh, Psalms 39. Turn backwards. Psalms comes in front of Proverbs. Go to Psalms 39 with me. I got a couple things I want to share and a couple other things. One more thing after that and we'll be done. <laughs> we'll be out of here by 3 o'clock. No, I'm just kidding. I'll have you out here by 1 o'clock. Watch this. All right, watch this in Psalms 39. 
And we'll look at it in verse number, uh, verse number one. Verse number one. See, there's a verse that I pray every time I preach. And I, I say every, and I, I really believe it is, it's every. And that's, Lord, make my tongue the pen of a ready writer. That's Psalms 45, one. Make my tongue the pen of a ready writer. Well, Proverbs 3, 3 says that our heart is a tablet. My heart is a tablet. Your heart is a tablet. When we speak, we write on those tablets. And, and every time we speak, you know, it's not with a pencil with a good eraser. It's based on that relationship whether or not there's an eraser. Because most of what we say is, is spoken with a permanent marker. But we got to recognize when you, when, you, when you speak a word, you publish that thing. And, and you'll, you, that thing can come back, especially in marriage. You know, she'll say, well, September the 3rd. We were standing in the kitchen. Johnny was two. And you said, you're like, wait, baby, Johnny's got kids of his own now. <laughs> and then she'll, you'll say, how do you remember that? Because I'll never forget how that made me feel. Permanent marker. Brothers, I'm trying to help you. <laughs> All right, well, watch this in Psalms 39. If you're there, say amen. Verse 1. I said, I will take heed to my ways. Notice the next statement. That I sin not with my tongue. That I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. Now, the wicked would be your enemies. Your wicked would, the wicked would be those people that aren't even for you. So when you speak, you know, a word out of character, your, your enemies are ready to, to hold you accountable or to use that information against you. But there's none more wicked than the wicked one. And so you don't want to give the, your enemy information because he, he don't know your heart. Only God knows your heart. But notice here how David uh, said, he said, I got to give heed to my ways that I don't sin with my tongue. Now, let me, let, let, let's, let's just think about this real quick. Um, are, are, have we been sinful with our mouth? Because I showed you earlier that when a man just speaks and spews out a, multitudes of wor a multitude of words, there'll be no want of sin. You won't have problem finding sin with someone that's just spewing out words all the time. All right? That's, that's Proverbs 10, 19. So I want you to think just briefly, because I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you this in Scripture, but I want you to think just briefly of what would happen today if you came before the Lord. If, if the Lord manifest his presence, if we, were, if we were caught up before his temple and we saw God, or you saw God, what would be your response? I assure you, our response would be one of humility. We would fall on our face. We would be repentant. We'd be asking for forgiveness and grace. I know I would, right? But what would we really think about if we had to stand before God right now? Well, thankfully, there's a man in Scripture that happened to, and we got his record. It's Isaiah, and it's recorded in Isaiah 1. You don't have to turn there, but I want to share it with you. In Isaiah 6, verse 1 this is what Isaiah said. He said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Verse 5. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone. I'm going to stop right there. When Isaiah, the prophet, stood before God, the first words that he said was, woe is me, I am undone. And when you think about it, isn't that the right response to, 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 of standing before a holy God? Think about it like this. The closer you get to God, the more light shines on our darkness. In other words, you cannot get close to God and not see the mess of self. 
Amen. At the beginning of the Apostle Paul's ministry, he was the 12th apostle. Judas was gone. They looked for a replacement. Jesus told, chose Saul on the road to Damascus. He's the apostle that was called of Jesus that didn't actually walk with Jesus for three and a half years like the other apostles did. And what did Paul say at the beginning of his ministry? This is what he said. He said, I am the least of the apostles. That was his record of himself. I am the least of the apostles. I came in last. I didn't have the advantage of walking with Jesus like the others did. I'm the least of the apostles. When you read the story of his life, and he's at the, at the point of the end of his life, this is what Paul said about himself. He said, I'm the chief of sinners. If you didn't know any better, you'd say, man, Paul, did you backslide? Because you went from being the least of the apostles to being the chief among sinners. No, the closer you get to God, the more you realize just how much you miss it. Amen. Only religion gives a man accolade of years of service and makes him, well, because we say this kind of mess at funerals. Well, if anybody is in heaven, this soul right here is there. That's works. That's religion. Nobody's in heaven outside the blood of Jesus. Nobody's in heaven outside the grace of God. It doesn't matter how good you looked or how well you performed or how faithful you were. Nobody gets to him without Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? Amen. But we have this idea that the closer you get to God, then the more arrogant and prideful you ought to be. But that's backwards. The closer I get to God, the more I'm facing what's wrong with me. I experience that in worship week after week where I'm sitting here and Jay Lee's leading and I'm worshiping and I'm thinking, man, Lord, forgive me for this. Lord, I plead your blood over my mind, my body, and my spirit. Lord, fill me with your spirit so I can do what you called me to do. It's in worship. I'm thinking about the things I need to let go of, the people people I need to forgive, the things I need to surrender. I'm not thinking about, oh, wow, I really got it together in your presence. Isn't that real? But watch what Isaiah does in God's presence. He says this in Isaiah 6, verse 5. Then said I, woe is me, I am undone. And here's what he says next. Because, because I am a man of unclean lips. He went to God and said, I am, woe is me. I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, says a prophet, says the prophet Isaiah, who spoke of a virgin that would be with child in Isaiah 7, who spoke of the name of Emmanuel in in Isaiah 7, 14, who spoke of this Jesus that would come, who would be wonderful and counselor and everlasting father, prince of peace and mighty God, who spoke in Isaiah 53 that this man would bear stripes for our healing, who prophesied that this man would be anointed by the Spirit in Isaiah 61. This prophet of God, when he got in front of God, said, woe is me, I am undone, my lips are unclean. That's what a prophet of God said in his presence. In God's presence, the first thing that he addressed was his unclean lips. And then he says this, he said, for I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. When he got before God, he realized just how filthy his mouth was. Wow. Man, that's heavy. That that, 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 that in the presence of God, I'm being held accountable for what I've been saying, for my words. We got to get to a place where we start taming our tongue and realize how spiritual and how powerful our words are. Proverbs 18, 20, 21 says it like this. A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth and with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. What does that mean? I'm going to fill my life with what I say. My life will be filled with what I say. He then says this in verse 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. He's saying in that verse, your words are seed. Your words are seed. And when you just spew words out, you're planting seed. And based on what type of words they were, one day you start walking in a bad harvest because you've been planting bad seed with your mouth. But he says one thing for certain, we're all going to walk in the harvest of what we've been saying. So therefore, I know I don't want to walk in the harvest of everything I've been thinking because I have some stinking thinking sometimes. 
So I just can't let whatever I think out of my mouth and then walk in the harvest of that thing, have a fallout in my life. Let's go back to Job. It's right in front of Psalms. And I got, I'm almost there. Go with me to Job, to six, the sixth chapter. We might actually deal with Job in this series. I don't know if we will or not, but we may. Lord's will be done. I'm going to tell you why. Job and the story of Job is about a man who was tried, lost everything he had because the enemy wanted to touch him and God came at the end and restored him. Everything he lost double. But what was the enemy after when you studied Job? We may study it in the series. The enemy came to God and he said, I notice you've got a hedge of protection around Job. Take that hedge down. I want to touch him. I want to mess with him. He said, if you let me touch him, I'll make him curse you. Think about that for a minute. What was Satan after when he came to God about Job? He was after Job's words. He said, if you let me touch him, I'll have him cursing you. That's all Satan wanted. I want to change what he says. And God said, you know what? Every, all that he has is under your power, but you're not going to touch his life. And who did Satan use? There's only one person in the whole book that actually said exactly what the enemy said. Remember, the enemy's agenda was, I'm going to make Job curse you. And you know who told him in his inner circle to curse God? His wife. His wife said, why don't you just go on and curse God? See, that was the words of the enemy. And wouldn't it be horrible if you and I voiced our thoughts, but the thought was the planning of the enemy, and we were being used as pawns to advance the enemy's agenda? Wouldn't it be horrible if the enemy has already been whispering things in your mind? You're worth nothing. You're worth nothing. You're never going to be anything. Your mama wasn't nothing. Your daddy ain't nothing. You'll never be nothing. But those words torment you, and you cast them down, and you get in the Bible, and you, you get around people that are edifying. But then the closest one to you starts mirroring those exact words the enemy's been whispering. Now it matters because the voices that have been in your head have now come out of someone's mouth that you love and cherish, and that person is now being used as a pawn to advance what the enemy was up to. My point is, is we don't need to be that pawn. You'd never know who you're talking to. You never know who you're speaking to. You just can't say what comes to mind because that thought that's in your mind might be the planting of the enemy himself, and none of us want to be a pawn used by the enemy to advance his agenda in somebody else's life. Is this making sense? And who was the next person to speak against God? His friends gave him bad counsel. When Satan couldn't get through to Job himself, he used his wife and his friends. All right, that might come up later. My brother's like, come on with that, Pastor. Can you share a little more? No, because it, it goes both ways. There's some wives that the enemy wants to use your husbands to say what the enemy's been saying in your head. The point is, is that the enemy wants to use the people closest to us to destroy us. Well, what, 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 where, where did the wounds come from in Psalm? Where did David say those wounds came from? Where did the prophets say those wounds came from? We get, we get this mirrored in, 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 in the Psalms and in, in prophecy that these wounds came from the house of a friend. The people closest to you are the ones that can hurt you the most. And that's why we got to be most sensitive to those people when it comes to what we say. Because a stranger would say it and it would roll off. But when you say it, it meant everything. What did Jesus say to Judas when he kissed him? Friend, you betrayed me with a kiss? So watch this in Job and we'll look at it in verse number I told you. Did I tell you? All right, chapter 6, verse 24. Chapter 6, verse 24. I'm almost done. We're going to turn to one other scripture after this one. We're almost done. But don't miss the next scripture so you can beat everybody out of the parking lot. 
All right, watch verse 24. Teach me, and I will hold my tongue. Let's read that out loud. Teach me, and I will hold my tongue. What does this mean? I have to be taught how to hold my tongue. And that's what this series is all about. Teach, I need it. You need We all need it. Teach us, Lord, how to hold our tongue. Cause me to understand wherein I have erred. I need to know a lot of the stuff I brought on myself because of my loose mouth. Write this verse in, this verse in your notes. Proverbs 21, 23 says, Whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. Which means your mouth, our mouth, can get us in trouble. What do we do? To, what do we tend to do when our mouth gets us in trouble? We do what Proverbs 26, 19 tells us not to do. I'll read it. Proverbs 26, 18 and 19 says this. For your notes, I know you're in Job. Proverbs 26, 18 and 19 says this. As a madman who casteth firebrands, arrows, and death, so is the man that deceiveth his neighbor and saith, am not I in sport? Am not I in sport? Or I was only joking. See, there are times in our relationships that we're going to both be comical and say stuff in sarcasm. But then there are other times when we realize what we said didn't fly, and then we'll say, oh, I'm joking. Sarcasm is hidden anger. It's to take blank and put cake icing on it. Yeah. You fill in the blank. <laughs> but it ain't cake. <laughs> You're trying to sell something on me by putting it with a little coat of sugar on it called joking. But you really wasn't joking. And if you think about it, you know when folk are not joking. Even though they say I'm joking. No, you wasn't joking. You're trying to slide something in on me. You just gave me blank and put some sugar on it. Back to the scripture. <laughs> verse 24, teach me and I will hold my tongue and cause me to understand wherein I have erred. Now watch verse 25. How forcible are right words. Right words have force and power. But what doth your arguing reprove? So in other words, uh, arguing doesn't do anything. Fighting don't do anything. I need the right words. And I need to get out of the sarcasm because all sarcasm is is hidden anger and it's not working. All right, I want to show you this because this is so important. And so it's words that Jesus spoke and we'll, we'll close. Go with me to the New Testament, Matthew chapter 6. We're going to end right here. Jesus said something that, that we need to take because this will set us up for next week. Is this series helping? Already, it's part one. Is this helping anybody? Man, I need this word right here. Amen. Every one of us need this word. And I'm not preaching it like, oh, I got this all together. No, I'm preaching it because it's in Scripture. And I'm needing it just like everybody else does. All right, watch this in Matthew chapter 6. Let me show you this valuable point that Jesus gives us. Matthew 6. You get there, say amen. All right, watch this. So Jesus is in the heart of the Sermon on the Mount, teaching us how to do life. He makes this case in verse 24 that you can't serve God and money. You can always hold to one of them. And what influences us on who we serve is the way we think about life, verse 25. So he says in verse 25, watch the statement, verse 25, therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. Read that with me out loud. Take no thought for your life. And then he lists the thoughts we might take. What are you going to eat? What are you going to drink? What, what are you going to wear? How are you going to pay the mortgage? What about your insurance? See that? All the worries of life. Take no thought for your life. Everybody see that? Read it one more time, verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. Read that latter part one more time. Take no thought for your life. So then that leads him into this sermon about the fowls of the air, the lilies of the field, and the grass in the field that becomes our bread. And then he goes back to the same point in verse 31, except he adds something. Look at verse 31. Can you see what he adds behind the word thought? Saying. 
So let's read the same thing again, except add what he added. That's the word saying. Ready? Read. Therefore, take no thought, saying. Don't overlook that comma. Try it again. Therefore, take no thought, saying. So how do you take a thought? By saying it. I don't have to accept every thought. It's like the old preacher said long before I existed, you can't stop the birds from flying around your head, but you can prevent them from building a nest in your hair. I say it this way. You might not be able to stop the UPS man from ringing your doorbell, but you don't have to sign for the package. So thoughts come into our mind, and we'll talk about 2 Corinthians chapter 10 in the next week or two and what I'm supposed to do with a thought, and I want to show you in the Word how to break a thought and how to conquer a thought and how to get a thought held captive and break it down. You're going to learn all kinds of things from the Word on how to handle thoughts, and, and there's ways that you can overcome your thought life, and we're going to look in the Word and see how to do that. But Jesus gave us this simple, simple truth. Therefore, read it again. Therefore, take no thought saying it. So just because you have the thought doesn't mean you have to accept it. Saying it is the endorsement. Saying it is the acceptance. Saying it is the decision in line with the thought. We got to stop thinking out loud because some of this thinking is thinking. It's thinking, thinking. I don't need this out. This would affect my marriage. This would affect my child. This would affect my relationship. Our relationships. I can't just say everything I think. Take no thought saying it. Jesus is saying, stop saying stuff you don't want. If you don't want to die, then don't say this COVID is going to kill me. Well, I've been thinking it. I know you've been thinking it, but you can't confess it. You got to take that thought and come behind it with a word thought and declare, with his stripes I am healed. He satisfies me with long life and shows me his salvation. We're going to talk about this in the next couple of weeks. I'm going to show you how to take a negative thought, cast that thing down, come behind it with a word thought, and conquer that thought with the word of God. You just can't say everything you think. Well, I don't know how we're going to make it. I don't know how we're going to make it. She done lost her job. We're going to lose house. We're going to lose house. Lose house. Would you hush your mouth? You ain't going to lose the house because never have the righteous been forsaken or his seed begging bread. You've got to learn how to speak the word. You can't just say everything you think. <laughs> Saying the thought is accepting the thought. Jesus just taught us that. I'm done for today. We'll pick it up there next week, Lord willing, okay? Oh, hallelujah. I want to pray for you, and then I'm going to pray with you, and we'll be dismissed here in a few minutes, okay? Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we thank you today for your word. You've said in Psalm 107 and 20 that you send us your word to heal us and to deliver us from all of our destructions. So I pray for every life. I pray for every relationship right now that perhaps today has been damaged by the use of words. And we ask you today, Father, to give us wisdom to know how to control our thought life. That you would give us the conviction to know what to say, when to say it, how to say it, where to say it. With every head bowed, how does this apply to your life? Just meditate on that before the Lord just for a minute. What have you been saying to the people you love? Life is hard right now. This world is crazy. We're dealing with this COVID issue and government and social media. And just It's a wild world right now. It's so easy to get stressed, frustrated. Went to your favorite restaurant an hour to get you in the seats. Not their fault. Nobody's working. It's a different world. We can't take it out on the people we love.
You feel exhausted. You've been working. You're stressing to keep the house in order, the bills paid. Your kids want more time. We're lashing out on the ones that matter. Oh, man, Jesus, help us. Father, I pray for that marriage right now that's struggling. I ask for peace and healing. I pray for relationships between marriages and parents and children and friendships. We ask you for healing. You are the healer. And we ask you for wisdom to apply what we've heard and read in your word today. In Jesus' name. I invite you to pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I'm seeing in your word of how I can sin with my mouth when there's no guard on my lips and my thoughts go unchecked. I ask forgiveness. And I acknowledge you as my Savior. That you're always teaching me. For you went to the cross silent before your accusers. That I could have salvation. So I ask forgiveness of my sins. And I believe you died for me. And woe is me. And I am undone. And I've had unclean lips. I relate to Isaiah. And I ask forgiveness. And I believe you died for me. And I believe you were raised from the dead. That I could live for you. That I could walk in newness of life. So I ask that you would fill me with your spirit. And give me a conviction of your word. That my faith in you would show up in my life. That you would make me different that you would be glorified in the way I talk to people, especially those I love. So use me to bring peace and healing in relationships, beginning with my own. Use my life to bring you glory and to advance your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.